I feel remarkably cheerful and healthy. I've been off chemotherapy for uh, more than a year, so I've recovered from that and I've started on something else. But I think it does in terms of coming to terms with the disease and understanding my relationship to it, if you like. And I'm just now, over the past couple of months, thinking, well, I can help myself in so many ways through diet and through the way I live and through the way I am so psychologically, generally in attitude. And all those are little tiles in a, what I call a mosaic of recovery. They all build to help you, you feel better. It's almost quite a few things you've, you've got to reconcile. It's your own attitude to it, but then the, the impact that has particularly on your members of your family. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm very lucky to have a, a, a truly wonderful family and um, especially, a, as uh, Nagel will know, a remarkable wife as mm. well who's been a, an absolute rock. And it has been very difficult for them as well, but I, 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 I think I say at the end of the, the documentary, if you have love in your life and enough love in your life, uh, that really does carry you through. And I've been uh, really blown away by the amount of support I've had from people, not just within my family, but from friends and people I don't know who've been in touch uh, wishing me well. And all those things, in a little way, they all count. Uh, Bill, one of the other things we see in the documentary, and this has got quite a bit of press coverage, is, is you trying um, some sort of alternative therapies. And one of those was, was cannabis oil. And you're, you're laughing, give, giving us an answer. And that actually gave you a bit of a fit of the giggles, didn't it? What was that like being on that? Well, um, it, it just made me high and, and, and very lightheaded. We speak to Dr. Peter McCormick in the, in the film who's, who shows that uh, THC in cannabis, which is the bit that makes you make high, uh, does kill cancer cells. And it's just a question of getting more research done to see uh, what <clears throat> generally the effect would be on human beings. So it was, I mean, it was... To be honest, it was an enjoyable experience. I wouldn't do it every day, uh, and I have tried it for a while. I've just s stopped doing it recently because I wasn't sure where it was taking me. What do you want to be telling people? Or, you know, when you meet someone who, who is suffering with cancer, what do you say to them when, when really most of us kind of have go to the doctor, do as we're told? But that's changing, isn't it? Well, I think attitude is everything. I think you have to stay with conventional medicine unless you have really grand, good grounds for not doing so. Um, chemotherapy is... Is, a, you know, is pretty tough love, but it's, for many people, the best thing that, that we've got. But I do say you, you need to understand you can help yourself to heal. You have to understand, I think, really how maybe why you got ill, have a think about that, and then think, what can I do to help myself? And all these things add up in terms of, of diet, say not doing alcohol anymore because that takes up you know, away from your body's energy to, to build the immune system. So... Uh, attitude is is everything would you have changed anything if you could have looked back and just said it I mean is it even worth thinking about I wouldn't have drunk as much or I would have eaten more healthily or is, is that just pointless I think I would have gone to the doctor more than once in four years I think that was my mistake I thought oh, I'm really healthy I don't have any problems I got I got checked a couple of times I got checked when I was 40 I was fine I got checked when I was 50 I was fine I had uh, no cancer in my family so I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to be absolutely right. Thank you very much indeed. And it turns out uh, that, that I wasn't. So you, people, I think, if I'd had the opportunity again, I would have monitored my health more closely. How, how much of an encouragement has it been to you, the impact that you have had on others? The, the, the idea that, that, that I have been able to do some good with my illness keeps me going. And I think Stephen probably feels the, the same way. I still have people getting in touch with me saying, thank you so much because I discovered that I had prostate cancer and I got it treated early and now I can live a life that I might not have been able to do otherwise. It doesn't make it entirely worthwhile, but it certainly, it, you know, it, it softens the difficulty. And uh, Bill, what is the prognosis? What are you able to tell us this morning? Well, um, the official prognosis would probably be that, uh, let me see, when I started I was given 10, then 12 to 14 years, and then um, Vincent Koo, my oncologist, said, well, he wants to get me to... To 80 but I the way I look at it is I kind of put that to one side and I think well I'll, I'm going to live for as long as I'm going to live for and um, whatever happens happens and if I can help make myself better that's great and if I don't well that's 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 fine as well so I'm just going to keep living uh, as long as Bill Turnbull was born in Guildford Surrey on January 25th 1956, very devastating news after his loss. Actually, his father was a commodities broker and his mother told him...
at the, that same school where Turnbull actually also studied. She did mess around with maternity leave and Turnbull recalled in one of the interviews, he said that one day she took him in the staff room in the basket when actually he was just two years old. She was really a very working and hardworking lady. So at the age of eight, he was sent to the boarding school near East Court. The strict regime was a complete shock to his system. Turnbull actually revealed also in one of the interviews, and he said it was like being in a prison. He spent much of his time in fear of being caned, and if school days are your happiest days, for him, he doesn't think like that. So he was really um, a very stubborn but hardworking boy. And during his school times, one day he said he was really left very devastated because actually the teachers treated him in a way which wasn't even possible. Going further into his history, Turnbull enjoyed his time at Einberg University where he studied politics and began writing for the student newspaper. He graduated from the Center for Journalism Studies in Cardiff and found work at Radio Clyde in Glasgow. Like many aspiring journalists, he found his first real job difficult, realizing that he simply didn't know very much. In one of the interviews he held back then in around 1986, he said it wasn't always very easy to get a job during that time. And later on, during that year, he joined the BBC Today program. Two years later, he became a reporter for the BBC Breakfast Time, where he covered both the Lakabi disaster and the Romanian revolution. For the next decade, we see Turnbull rising through different levels of life and actually reporting from more than 30 countries before he actually joined the BBC Breakfast Show. He has been suffering with health-related issues regarding his prostate and he actually discovered this when he had went for a charity to stand up for health related issues and during filming that's when he found out that he had the disease himself he has been doing lots of charity and he has been encouraging so many people to go for regular checkups to be specific men to encourage them to go for regular checkups and his works have also influenced so many people because for the checkups numbers have risen to up to 250 percent in this moment in time, we are sending our prayers and condolences to his family, friends, the fans, and everyone who really loved Turnbull. Rest in power, the king, Turnbull.